Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. All right, before we begin, let's just see. I have to tell you that I know what one of your superpowers is. Are you ready? You know exactly what everyone around you should be doing. Tell me I'm wrong. Like, you know exactly what your kids, your partner, your parents and friends, heck, even the people responsible for US foreign policy, you know what they need to be doing to live their best lives. And it's not your fault. You've been this way as long as you can remember because you can see things that other people can't, right? We're like that kid on the sixth sense. Like you can see when people are about to do dumb things that will cause a domino effect of other dumb things. And you know exactly what they need to do to not do those dumb things, right? Like your kid, for example, your kid left their homework folder at school again, again. Now they can't get a zero on that assignment. Hell no, you're not gonna let that happen. What kind of mom are you, right? A caring one, that's who, you care. So you are going to turn your car right back around. You're gonna march that kid back into the school and get his or her folder. Even if he's late for practice and you have to put dinner on late again or skip it all together again, you know why? You're a good mom. Also, your partner's good at, at their job, but you just know they could be doing better. You just know it. They could show a little more initiative. They could like reach out to new clients. They could hit their sales quota and finally, finally get that raise that they have deserved for years. You know it, you see it. So you tell them, of course, you send them Forbes articles with um, listicle tips. You ask the little questions while they're watching the game. God, another game. Why God? Why another game? To see if they have any plans to, you know, better themselves. But you know what? They don't. They just don't. And you smolder on the couch with your Kindle for the rest of the night. And yet, and yet, it's not your job to exercise that incredible superpower of yours. Turns out, it's not your job to solve every single problem that you see both happening and impending. I promise you it's not. How does it make you feel when I say this? I mean, what good are you, right? If you're not helping the people that you love. Um, maybe it's not that we are helping as much as we are controlling. Um, maybe you and I, are just a tiny little bit codependent. God, you know, you don't even know you're doing it either. I for sure didn't. I mean, for years, I just thought I was being a good wife, a good mom, um, a good leader. I cared. Like, isn't that what you do when you care? Don't you try to push people to be their best selves? Like, don't you help them become the best people they can be? Don't you help them avoid failure and suffering if you can see it coming? Okay, let me be honest with you as an Enneagram three. I know that feeling so well, the one that tells you that you can help everyone be their best. But here's the thing. I spent so much of my life doing that, not so much because I wanted them to be the best, but because I wanted to be the best. That's a fact. Uh, it gets weird in our heads sometimes. Like, I get it. I see you. I love you. But man, this is our struggle, right? So um, back to my people. I used to think that if they ended up being the people I wanted them to be, the ones that I saw that they could be, wouldn't that make us all better? But here's the thing. It was a fantasy. And it was a fantasy making us all miserable. And it's not that it's all like sunshine now. This is not that kind of story, of course. Um, after a lot of therapy, a lot of learning, what I see now is that there's only so much responsibility in the room and it doesn't make sense for one person to take it all. That's, that doesn't make sense. Um, and also no one's asking anyone to take all the responsibilities. Um, but what happens when we take on things that are not ours, we take up all the air in the room because you know why? At that point, there's only room for our thoughts and opinions. No one else's matter because we don't let them matter. People don't get to take responsibility for their own problems and choices and decisions for their own lives because we are too busy dictating to them what their lives should look like, right? 
What, what we want them to do is follow the script that we are setting out for them, even if that is not who they are supposed to be, who they want to be, who they should. It, it makes sense to us when we're doing it because we don't know any other way to be. She says, listen, you've got to be on guard at all times. You're supposed to know the answers for everyone because if you slip up, even once, things will be damaged beyond repair. Someone will get hurt and it's going to be your fault. But that is not true and it was never true. Okay, let's flip it. Can you imagine what it's like to be on the receiving end of codependency? That your only job is to live up to the expectations of someone else. And if you don't, you're going to crush them. You're going to void the meaning of their life because you had the audacity to make some decisions for yourself, like decisions that honor the person you want to be, you're meant to be, right? The thing about codependency is it doesn't leave room for mistakes. It doesn't leave room for growth. It doesn't leave room for flourishing. It only leaves room for fear because all we're doing at that point is reacting against the things that make us feel afraid. And I'll tell you what, it's almost impossible to flourish when you're making decisions based out of fear. When you have lived decades of your life with your brain programmed to make decisions based on codependency, it is not something you can easily entangle from your synopsis overnight. Uh, that's a fact. But knowing what it is, what it looks like, how it might be a part of your life, your relationships, that's the first step toward making an enormous change for the better. Um, you don't realize how much you're carrying unfairly, unwarranted until someone helps you put that burden down. And when you take off the backpack full of responsibility for everybody else that was never yours, you will become overwhelmed by how much lighter you feel, how much easier it is to access joy all the time. You start to feel wholehearted. You start to be responsible for the one and only person that you are genuinely responsible for, and that's yourself. So besides my wonderful therapist, someone who's helped me take off that pack, Probably the best teacher I have encountered, the one who has led me the absolute most in this is Melody Betty. Um, if you've been around me for a, a minute, you have heard me absolutely rave about her book called Codependent No More. It changed my life. I'm, I don't say that often and I don't say it lightly. Um, I tell her this here in a minute, but Brene Brown, told me to buy that book and that it would become my Bible. And she was not wrong. And it made me so mad, that book. It made me so mad. I pitched her on the ground a couple of times. I'm like, how dare she? How dare she interrupt my victim story? Um, but her work has mattered to me so much. Melody, Betty, you guys. I mean, if you know, you know, she is an absolute legend. If you're new to her, You'll see about this very soon. So let me just tell you very quickly before we start this incredible conversation. Melody is a gifted writer and wonderful human. So you guys listen to this back in 1986 when absolutely nobody was talking about codependency. Like we didn't even have that word. She wrote a groundbreaking book called Codependent No More. And so really for the first time, she put so many people's experiences into a readable and understandable book. And not only that, she taught us real actionable ways to both recognize codependent behavior in ourselves, why we might have chosen to behave that way all this time and how we could choose to behave differently. Um, it became an instant classic. It has literally sold a trillion copies all over the world uh, for good reason. Um, uh, it, it's because she's come in like with, with the with a scalpel and cut away to this very precise way of behaving and relating to one another that is all cloaked in good intentions and self-righteousness, but is actually ruining our relationships. And she shows us a path out. She grabs us by our hands and she says, there's another way to do this. And it has meant the world to me. I was so excited so excited to record this with her. And we knew we wanted to give this to our premium listeners um, because she is an absolute legend. Um, and then she shocks me by saying this one is her very first podcast she's ever done. I'm like, well, 
I don't even know how to respond to that, <laughs> but I'm flattered and I'm honored and I'm so thrilled um, to bring this absolutely brilliant conversation with the one and only Melody Betty. Melody, I feel a little flustered because you and your work have meant so much to me. It has, you have been unbeknownst to you, a mentor to me and a teacher, like an absolute counselor and therapist. And your work threw a light on in a room that I did not even know was dark. And so I am honored, genuinely honored to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for being here. You know, everything you said that the book helped you with was what my, truly what my deep spiritual intentions were when I both researched the book because I was locked in a dark room and I didn't even know I was locked in a dark room. I didn't know if this was the way life was supposed to be and I had to accept it. I had no idea, but it was everything I intended that book to be. So thank you for saying that. I um it's so interesting because we are talking about a book that you wrote. What year did the, did the, did Codependent No More come out? 1986. I mean, I know, it's like talking about all the help we got from Little House on the Prairie, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's so interesting though, is you're just a pioneer in the conversation. I mean, at a time when we didn't even have this word. No, my in computer our vocabulary. kept lagging it. I was on one of the first home computers ever when I wrote that book and it just did not want to let, wrote it on a floppy disk, um, still have the floppy disk and the computer kept taking it. Now, everyone on YouTube, wherever has heard the word codependency That's or right. nearly everyone has heard that word. And for good reason, because <laughs> it has so deeply affected our behaviors, our relationships. It is almost ubiquitous. I. Um, I have talked about you and your book inside my community so much and so often. I, I think my community thinks you and I are absolute best friends to hear me talk about you. But at this point, I have essentially bullied my entire million plus women community into reading your work. And it's so crazy how common this is, how common codependency is inside our learned behaviors. and you give us language and instruction around it that is genuinely like changing our lives. I mean, it's changing our relationships and our behaviors and our sense of peace. And, and so, I mean, you may have written this book in the eighties, but it is absolutely as salient today as it ever was, if not more so. Um, and so first of all, thank you for being willing to talk about this work that has been a part of your career for so damn long. It's been a part um, of my life, my whole life. You know, because until I understood my codependency, I, I didn't really feel like I had a life. You know, I was just kind of responding to others wherever I went. That's right. That's exactly right. And that felt like being helpful. And I'm saying that from experience. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's start here, Melody. I, right. for any of my listeners <clears throat> who haven't yet heard me yammer about you, I have already introduced you okay. um, to my community um, and sort of high leveled who you are and what it is that you do, um, particularly Codependent No More, just a masterpiece um, of work. But if you would, if you wouldn't mind, could you walk back a little bit? I would love to hear, and you just sort of alluded to it, what was life like for you? What did it look like in the years before you began the research and the heavy lift of writing Codependent No More? Like what what had happened or was currently happening in your life to make you even steer into these waters? Um, what was the impetus for you saying something is here that I don't understand? You really wanna hear it? I really wanna hear it. Okay. I came from a dysfunctional family that saying is very popular now. We didn't have it back then. We just yeah. knew we came from it and we walked around wounded. We didn't know we were damaged. Hmm. And I had started drinking when I was 11, just like before school in the morning, before just to medicate because yeah. we didn't have 
antidepressants in either. Um, and I came from a very crazy family. So by the time I turned 18, I was into alcohol. I, my alcoholism was full blown. I was running, I was running away from my home. And ultimately that ended me up in treatment um, in Wilmer, Minnesota. And I was there for eight months, very long treatment stay, yeah. but it did the trick. I, I, I still feel like that was home to me. It was mm. college, it was home, it was everything I needed. I went out, well, it was almost everything I needed. Mm. I went out in the world knowing I would have to attend AA the rest of my life if I wanted yeah. to be sober. And I waited my obligatory two years before getting married. And I married, I would say, one of the most eligible bachelors in Minnesota. He was, his family had started this huge treatment conglomerate. Mm. He was director. He was involved in diversion. He was getting people out of prison to go to treatment instead. Mm. And he was everything I wanted. I thought, oh, we could devote our lives to living this idyllic life. Mm. Well, not so much. Mm. Yeah, Not so much. He was still drinking. Oh, wow. And lying mm. about it and hiding it. Mercy. And I didn't know it yet. It took a while for me to find out. But meanwhile, because of what I had been through, I wanted to work to help other people as a counselor, chemically mm. dependent people as a counselor. And I wanted to work at the treatment center that his family had started as a counselor. But they said, no, keep government funding now we got to do something for the families you get to do that I thought oh great I get to work with my mom you know mm -hmm. <laughs> totally yeah delight so, mm. um I found myself sitting in a group counseling the spouses of all the chemically dependent people who in that program may have been there as a result of having been in prison I mean mm -hmm. they they weren't your easy addicts that's right. You know, they, they were your play hard crew. And I was trying to use all the skills I had learned at university to help them and nothing worked. All they wanted to do was talk about the other person. If I asked them how they felt, they told me how the other person felt. If I asked them what their goals were, they told me what the other person's goals should be. That's right. I, and I thought, oh my God. And at first, I, I, I didn't want to do this group, but it was my only way into what I thought was my dream. I never wanted to be the poster girl for codependency. I didn't. Sure. I didn't. I didn't uh, we didn't even have that word then. But I wanted to do right by this group of women. And I wanted to understand what they were going through. None of the traditional therapy efforts worked with them. Yeah. And at some point in that group, a light came on. And I, by then I understood that I had married, not a recovering alcoholic, but a practicing alcoholic. Yes. And I was into my own codependency. I had to yes. keep it downplayed during the group I was doing. And that's how I came to grow interested in this subject. Uh, my whole life was consumed, not just with reacting to the alcoholic, but yeah. gradually reacting to everyone around me, whether it was a neighbor or a friend yeah. or whatever, mm -hmm. just the, the same behaviors. We don't drop our behaviors at the door. You That's know? right. If this Wherever is how you go, are, there you people, are. Yeah, exactly. And so I became obsessed with finding out what had done this to me and what I could do to heal. Mm -hmm. And I was equally ticked off because I had one large problem already, right? My chemical yeah, dependency. I didn't, I didn't want another one. I didn't think it was no, fair. No, I that was, was enough. Not, mm -hmm. not happy at all about this curveball life threw me, but I did catch it. Where did you start looking? Because you were one of the very first to begin to wrap data and language around this concept. Who taught you? Where did you find, how did you, where did you dig to begin to discover what codependency even is? Anywhere and everywhere I could. You know, mm. bookstores didn't help have self-help sections left. <laughs> That's um, true. Yet, I mean, they didn't have them yet. You had to like dig through all the other books. So you couldn't go into a bookstore and see everything in one place. I went to the universities, but Freud wasn't very helpful. You know, mm. it didn't it didn't apply to my daily life, this abstract psychological language. I thought, how does that help me? 
you know, it mm-hmm. doesn't help. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a few people, there were a few professionals writing and they had pamphlets out, you know, like little pamphlets. There was Alan on, they had things you passed around yeah. then. And we had the library that wasn't much help either. Yeah. It was catch as catch can. Oh, yeah. and we had Ernie Larson in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. We had mm-hmm. Ernie Larson and he was out. Bless his soul, he's passed now. But mm-hmm. he was doing the seminars in church, you know, using the church as a platform. Sure. Doing other places. And he called it back then second stage recovery or stage mm-hmm. two recovery. And mm-hmm. he would, um, Ernie was very Minnesotan, as I was then. But he he would talk about this and he'd come out with little blips that really helped me and were meaningful in my life. Like if the relationship is dead, bury it. You know, I mean, and they appear throughout Codependent No More, but everything that appears in there appears because it really helped me when I was by myself. Yeah. And then of course you find yourself steering this whole group of people. They're like a, a personal test case for you to sit there and probably learn from, you know, week in and week out what they are saying with these patterns that you are seeing repeated in this behavior. And so let's just start here from the highest level for somebody who's listening today and they are new to the concept. Let's just say they've been living under a rock. Mm -hmm. Can you just sort of describe in stark terms what codependency is? Codependency is being so obsessed with other people that that's all we can see and so out of touch with ourselves that we don't even see that anymore. Mm. It's, it's becoming a, Yeah, it is. It's very elusive because on, from the surface, it might look like we're doing things right, especially right. compared to the other person. And that's people right. may applaud us for our perseverance, for our forbearance. But there's nothing loving about being codependent. It, it just, it's not a loving thing to do. Sharon Stone, in her recent autobiography, and I don't have the title handy, but it was so good. And she talked about her sister. And she said, my sister always loved other people more than she loved herself. Mm, that's a good and way to put it. I know. So I would say that's a good description for a codependency. Mm. And of uh, course, you were starting from this space of spouses or partners of addicts, but codependency obviously transfers to virtually every possible behavior inside a relationship, right? It does. I mean, it, it's a human behavior. Yes. It, it does not have to be attached to dysfunction. Mm-hmm. I, I think that dysfunction helps us quick, more quickly become codependent. Yeah. Codependency is a human behavior. It does not need to be attached to alcoholism, to drug addiction. I mean, we we can become more easily codependent if it is attached to that, but it can get triggered by anything. It can get triggered by what's going on in society, you know, in, in, in the cultural consciousness. It's all around. And I I think people have gotten worse with it because yeah. part it's not just about the hell we put ourselves and other people right. through. It's about this whole process of getting detached from our inner core. Sense of being detached from ourselves, from not knowing who our self is and what that self really wants. And usually it's the most simplest of things, mm-hmm. but people have gotten so detached. And they, you know, it, the world seems a bit off and a bit crazy right now. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I mean, I am just telling you that your work may be more relevant today than ever. We need it more. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes, even often, we're faced with tough choices. All of us, really. Sometimes the path forward isn't that clear at all. So, I mean, really, show me a human person who hasn't dealt with this. I mean, decisions around, I mean, you name it, career, relationships, family. So many things. And I've been there, of course. And therapy helped me. It helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate everything life throws at you. So you can move forward, not just with confidence, but even like excitement. I've learned that trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. 
Like the more you practice it, the easier it gets. And so if you're thinking of trying therapy, just think about trying better help. It's entirely online. It's convenient and flexible, suited to your schedule. Just fill out a really brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if you need to. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash for the love today and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash for the love. We've been having some conversations over on the socials about the P word. You know the one, perimenopause. I guess this is a thing now for me and maybe you're there too. But anyway, a lot of weird things are going out of my body right now. And one common issue that every one of us in this season of life seems to have trouble with is sleep. It's like that elusive thing we're chasing and we can't seem to catch. But here's the thing. I've hacked it. Thanks to Focal. I really have. I'm shook by how much this has helped my sleep situation. They've, it's literally changed my sleep game. I started with their drops, and right now I've been loving their full-spectrum sleep gummies. I take them every night. They help me fall asleep, and more importantly for me, they help me stay asleep. Because in the before times, I'd catch a thought at 3 a.m., and then that was it. My brain was like, let's go. So even if you're not in perimenopause, but your sleep is just off for a million other reasons, give them a go. I've got a code for you if you want to try them out. Use code for the love to get 20% off at focal.com. So let me spell that for you. It's F O C L dot com. Okay. And your code is for the love for 20% off because sleep is priceless. Y'all thank me later. Right near the very beginning of the, of the pandemic, Mm -hmm. I lost a 26 year marriage and I wasn't prepared to lose it. And I, 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 I was in a fog of trying to understand everything what had gone wrong. And so Brene Brown called me and she's walking me through this like next steps. These, she's basically telling me what to do mm. and embedded in the, her short list of these are absolute ne- necessary next things that you do. One of them was your book. Oh. Um, she said, this is, this is, she called it, she goes, this is going to be your Bible, Jen. Um, order it right now, start reading it. And, and I'm just telling you that I, I ordered it on the spot, had it the next day. Cause that's how the world we live in. And I got, it. God I, bless got you. Maybe, I got two chapters into that thing. And I was like, damn it. I'm not going to read one more word of this. Not one more. This is not my fault. I am. How dare she? I mean, it was like you had read me the right act and every word of it was true and I have never had someone hold that mirror up to me and began to understand my own stuff my patterns the the ways in which I had contributed um just to this disintegration this unhealthy paradigm between two people I just couldn't believe it I just could not believe what you were telling me I felt so shook by the way in which you seem to understand my patterns. And so I can speak as somebody who was sort of new to your work. Sometimes the hardest, most impossible thing to do is recognize our own patterns of behavior. They're hard to even see, especially because as we say, they come wrapped in good intentions. We think, we think this is good. I want, I want what's best. I want what's best for you. I want what's best for us. I feel like I can see the right path for all of us, including you, 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 and you. Um, And so if we can drill down just a little bit more, how do we recognize codependent behavior in ourselves? What does it look like? Because it feels altruistic. It feels like this is me being a helper inside a relationship that matters to me. This is me trying to serve a person that I love and help him or her like pull through the mire. Um, And yet that is not at all how it acts inside of a relationship and the affection. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. So if you were going to say, okay, person, these are some things that you might notice in your behavior that is actually not helpful. That is called codependency. Mm-hmm. What are those things? That's a big can of worms. I know. Um, you're right. Seeing ourselves is probably the bravest yet most painful thing we're ever asked to do this lifetime. It's and brutal. then 
seeing ourselves every day for the rest of our lives instead of focusing on the other person and figuring out what they need to do to be yes. better, to make them happier, to live mm. better lives, all the things that we really should be doing for mm. ourselves, you know, but nobody ever told, told me. Oh, no, not me. I never heard this. No. Um, You know, and, and it's so hard to diagnose because yeah. flipping codependents feel so self-righteous. <laughs> they do. Say more about that because you are right. It's very hard to get in, which is why I wrote the book because I thought if they go to therapy, the therapist can say, go home and read this book and then come back and we'll talk that's after right. you've read the book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what therapists do, by the way. I don't know a therapist now who doesn't recommend your work. So they're like, listen, go do some homework. You let's get, let's get you at least on first or second base. Well, it gets everyone we can on an equal playing field. Yeah. Because I think the key to codependency is the victim story somewhere mm. underneath everything. There is a victim story and we're just simply writing the next page or the right next chapter of it. Every time we interact with someone. Ugh. That is so hard to hear. Um, because you are right. The way I wanted, the way I was telling my own story, both to myself, and then of course, anybody else who would listen, um, was that this has been done unto me, right? Like this is how hard I tried to keep the ship afloat. And it's so self-righteous. And, and, it, and it's all his fault. It's all his or her fault. It didn't work out. I did not. I did everything I could. I was the one holding it together as long as it was together. And it's just not true. It's just not a true story. Well, in our and, own minds, it is. Well, I wanted it to be true. It's so know, much tidier. I, know, I, know. I like it so much better. Um, um, it's, it's more comfortable to be a victim than to be like a co-creator of a toxic relationship. It, it's it's more comfortable not to have that responsibility. Too. It sure is. Um, and yet here's what's interesting. I mean, I can just speak to my own sort of experience with your work and what you taught me. I began to read your book in the context of a failed marriage. And so, you know, th that was the lens in which I was applying everything mm -hmm. I was learning. And I, that was the relationship that was in the forefront of my brain. But damn it, if what I didn't notice pretty quickly were my codependent behaviors as a parent. All of a sudden wow. I started going, oh no, oh, wait a minute. I do this with my kids too. I exhibit some of this exact same rescuing behavior, controlling behavior, constantly trying to sort out their choices to minimize discomfort, to maximize success. Um, and we're all miserable for it. I'm like, it wasn't even working too, by the way. So I don't even know why I kept trying it. Um, but I'd like to hear you talk more. Like, what is the difference between caring? Because we do care. We do care about the people that we love. We do care about our children, our partners, our co-work. We care. But what's the difference between caring about the choices that are making, the future that that's going to inevitably produce, and then crossing that line into codependency with them? Right. I think at some point, and one of the activities in the book talks about that, we need to sit down pen in hand and sort what our responsibilities are, true responsibilities for ourselves and for other people. And just take a, take a snapshot every day is what you're doing there. Because I think one of the situations that really exemplifies codependency is when we bring a brand new baby home from the hospital. Hmm. That's a very... In different circumstances, it would be considered very codependent. But when we bring our baby home, that's exactly what we're expected to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we're responsible for that human's life. We're responsible for their eating, their well-being every minute of the day. But then as they get a little older, people get impulses. And if mm -hmm. we're responding to every impulse the other person has, they never have to move. That's right. They never have to move. So I think it does, it, it does take a bit of stepping back and assessing what are my true responsibilities. And the real guide for that is in here. Mm. We need to be in touch with ourselves. 
unless and until we're in touch with ourselves, we're not going to know when we're crossing lines because boundaries aren't out there. They're in here. Mm. And if we don't know what's in here, it's going to be really hard for us to set a boundary. We won't be feeling the, the red flags or the beeps or any of that. Mm. That is hard work, that bit, that bit of turning inward and in the spirit of like true discovery, learning, what, what do I need and want? What, how is it that I matter in this relationship? Um, what's mine and what's not mine? Like what is not mine? And that's tricky. Like you mentioned detachment earlier and I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about it because detachment was a new idea to me on its face, just based on how we think that, what we think that word means, it sounds mm -hmm. a little cruel. It does. It sounds and, and very even, cold and uncaring. And the truth is codependents yeah. are some of the most caring people in the world. That's what yeah. got us into this mess. Yes, that's exactly right. Over caring. It, it, it feels, um, it even feels that way when you begin to practice it internally, especially when it's gone against the grain of the way we've related to a person or whatever for a long mm -hmm. time. It even feels weird in your body. Mm -hmm. um, it does. This sort of sense of loving um, detachment. And yet that is the, that is the key that turns the lock. It really it's is. It's a ticket to our freedom, to finding our own life, creating our own life and living our own life. And then occasionally helping others. Can you talk more about what um, like loving detachment looks like? Because I think there's this something that we're gonna have to just agree to accept is that when we detach from somebody else's choices and then that's the consequences of those, that means Sometimes bad things happen. It just does. And that is something we're going to have to accept that um, consequences belong to the person who made the choice. And it, we don't have to like it um, to, for that to still be the right thing. Um, and so and if we don't allow it, then we're taking their consequences. And someday there's going to come along a consequence we can't take for them. And it's going to be really bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not helpful. The, the, this is the plan as much as I can understand it. We are each responsible for our own behaviors. Oh, and if we get a behavior that produces a consequence, that's our consequence. That's our stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The end. Like when it comes down to brass tacks, it is kind of a simple concept um, that we are responsible for our own choices and reactions and behaviors as is everyone else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we make poor choices and then things happen on the other side of that. And that belongs to the person that made the choice, right. but it's so tricky because we don't want other people to suffer no. and we don't, we don't and want we're all them hoping to. for a little grace and mercy along the way. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, as we make our mistakes and we usually get that, but you know, it, it is so detrimental to take other people's consequences for them. And I, in the time I was growing up as a child, parents didn't do that so much. That's true. You know, it, it was it was a different era, but now I see so many hovering parents. Yes, really helicopter parents. Just yes. If kids aren't allowed to experience their own impulses, their own choices, but again, are we giving them the kind of love that would be helpful? Are we letting? Are we teaching them? Yeah. They can come talk to us, or every time they yeah. try and talk to us. Do we overload them with controlling and fear and, you know, how could you do that you know, to create a safe environment and create the safe parts of relationship, the loving parts, the good parts, mm. the parts mm. we're all looking for. That's so good. And, and the results of that are mature, self-aware human beings who learn what it means to take responsibility for their own lives. That really is what we want for our kids. It, yeah. It's what we want. We're just going about it the wrong way. Yeah. You say, you say codependents are reactionaries, not actionaries. Codependent behaviors are self-destructive. We frequently react to people who are destroying themselves. We react by learning to destroy ourselves. Ugh. <laughs> It's so and then heavy. Everyone is spinning around. Can you talk more about that? Sometimes we can react and it's okay. If we're reacting to a beautiful sunset, hmm. 
if we're reacting to a lovely meal we just had, um, a beautiful day, a brand new baby. If we're reacting to that, chances are we're not going to get in trouble. Hmm. If we're reacting to something, someone doing something dumb, stupid, they should have known better. Why did they do that? Didn't you know how much it would hurt me and hurt you? Hmm. Um, that's a different kind of reacting and they're not as harmless. It can, it just, reactions aren't helpful. They're hmm. like, they're like second class talking. Yeah. It's not our original talking. Learning to pause is one, one of the best superpowers we can get hmm. because it helps us. And, and that pause, is this my business? Hmm. Am question. I being judgy? Do they hmm. want, is my opinion necessary right now? Is it helpful? Is what I'm saying helpful? A good long pause can revolutionize our relationships or at least our relationship with ourselves. Because mm -hmm. if we react with something, then they react back with something. And pretty soon we're all just, react. we don't even remember what we're reacting to anymore. Totally, It got so spun off. But, but learning to pause is a very powerful, easy behavior that we mm -hmm. can do that can remarkably change our life. You're so right. I mean, that was one of my best takeaways from your work, which sounds, it almost sounds too simple to be effective, but it isn't. There is that moment where you can interrupt your own instinct to solve, to fix, to control and recognize it for what it was. I was telling a girlfriend of mine just this morning that I was going to interview you today because she and I have talked at length about what we've learned from you. So I texted her. I'm like, you're never going to believe how I'm interviewing today. And, um, I, I was telling her, I'm like, in the wake of codependent no more, I can now almost catch my codependent reactions in real time, almost. Sometimes it takes me just a minute. I can see it about an hour later and go, oh no, oh, oh, look what you did. But at this point, I can almost catch it by its tail, like as I am saying it and recognize it. And that pause is the tool. The pause is like, what my, my brain going, whoa, 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 is this your business? Is this yeah. your business? And the tricky thing is sometimes I'm like, it is my business, but sometimes it is not. Yeah. Um, even reframing what is my business and what is it like, okay, I had a kid, I have five kids and I had a kid this year in high school. So grown, big, like not little, in high school, who would not, would not get their selves out of bed in the morning for school, would not. Uh, and so I took this on as my problem because I thought, I don't want you to fail this year. I want you to go to class. Right. And so we it, want the best. I want you to, I want the best for you. I want you to go to school and graduate. And when I tell you this became literally my problem, I, I spent so much energy, anger, fury. I've already got you up once. I'm calling again. I'm in your room now, dragging you out of bed. And then I'm just spinning in my brain about it all the time. I'm feeling like a martyr. I am feeling like a victim to this person's resistance to, to self-responsibility. And they're and having fun. a good sleep. Yeah. Oh, she, she's having a great time. She's just in dreamland. Um, and it wasn't bothering her at all. And so I, all of a sudden, caught an eye. My eyeball saw your book on my desk. And I went, oh, Mike, look at what I am doing. I am spinning myself into a tizzy. This isn't my business. I already went to high school. I already have a diploma. Yeah. This is not mine. This is not mine. And I mean, I took my hands off the steering wheel and went, I hope that you'll choose to get out of bed and go to class since you're the student and you're old enough to get yourself awake. And if you don't, the consequences are yours. You can go to detention, you can fail, you can go to summer school, but that will be, I hope you don't choose that because I don't want that for you. But if you do, it's yours. Mm -hmm. All the peace flooded into my heart. Guess what I did every morning from then on out? I drank my coffee. I sat calmly on the couch. What's my problem? Um, but that's the kind of stuff that your work has helped me recognize. Even when I think, no, I, what kind of a mom would let her kid fail? That's the trick. Like who would do that? Who would allow someone else um, to create such harm in their own lives? And yet here we are. This is mm -hmm. the work of being codependent no more. Yeah. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with once in a while helping, helping a brother out, helping a yeah. friend out, 
that absolutely in fact it's an admiral part of life i'm talking about patterns here that's I'm talking right. about the way they make us feel which is crazy yeah. and pissed off that's right crazy and resentful so resentful and righteous oh, don't worst, forget the righteousness right? oh so righteous if everybody would just listen to us right if i know it would be such a much better say. world I was chatting with my book clubbers just the other day in one of our Zoom book talks about the fact that we've been reading together, you guys, for more than four years. It's crazy. We have read tons of incredible, impactful, thought-provoking, fun books during that time in the Jen Hatmaker Book Club. And this upcoming season is going to be amazing, too. I actually can't wait to get into the lineup of books we have planned. And if you weren't reading with us, let's fix that. When you're a book club member, not only do you get a book box delivered to your doorstep every month with the book, of course, and a special gift and love notes for me. It's so fun. But we also have live chats on Zoom in our private group. Plus, it's really the best corner of the internet over there. I mean, like, sure, we talk about books every month, of course, but also about life. People are making lifelong friends there and finding connection with others right in their towns, getting together with their local chapters. It's amazing. When you're in book club, you also, you guys get a whole bunch of digital resources like discussion guides and custom content and music playlists from our authors, which are our favorite. So just head over to jenhatmakerbookclub.com to sign up, start reading with us and making book friends. So you guys, we want you in. It's jenhatmakerbookclub.com. Oh, it's so true. So let me flip it. What, what happens when we recognize that someone in our lives is interacting with us using codependent behaviors. They, their, their language toward us, their response toward us is it's controlling, it's to mm -hmm. fix, it's to solve. Um, what, what does that look like to become healthy? Can you put some language in our hands in order to um, sort of disrupt that relational pattern when it's coming at us and not necessarily what we are responding with? This is overly simplistic too. I just ignore it. Hmm. I, yeah. I don't respond. There's, I'm not going to sit and teach like say a new boyfriend or something about codependency. That's too much. So I'll just, you know, and go yeah. about my business. And then if he wants to discuss it, he can, you know, and other others too, if they get overly um, impulsive about helping me or correcting me, I do just, no, I think it's good. You know, just, I don't want to get into teaching them about codependency. Yeah, that's not your work either. That's why I wrote the book. So that's so healthy. Like accessing the, the capacity to not let someone else's opinion constantly steer our own ship, no matter how well-intentioned they think they are. Uh -huh. That's a part of it. That is a part of it. Kind of pull the oxygen out of that room and it'll, it may snuff itself out. Um, but even if it doesn't, it's not controlling us and our responses. No, no. And if I don't like it that much, then I don't have to go around that person anymore, do I? That's right. That's your, that's our boundary. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear you talk about this because it would be unfair and untrue to suggest that changing our codependent behaviors toward other people, because they've come, become accustomed to it. They've become very accustomed to what we're willing uh, to step in and do and we're say about to and fix. Remove the rug from under their lives. It because has consequences. We have been their lives because we didn't have a life. So it, this goes badly sometimes. It, this it, goes badly. It can, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and when we stop making the people in our life feel so cozy with their every impulse, they get really ticked. They, they get really angry. Um, God bless my daughter. <laughs> I mean, she's old enough. I can no longer, I don't know if I can still really use examples from her, uh -huh. but um, when I told her her allowance was being cut off, she was mm. living in New York and, you know, not no longer living at home. I was living in California and I, I started giving her a year warning. Okay. Every month I would tell, you know, I, I don't think that's a fair thing to like jerk the rug out from her. Uh -huh. So I would uh, say, you know, next month, yeah. you're going to get a check the month after that you're going to get a check but in a year you're not going to get that check and then every yeah. month I would change that skill just a little bit so finally came the phone call 
she made to me, she said, you know, there's no check, there's no money. And I said, yeah, yeah I've been telling you, haven't I? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was mm -hmm. when all hell broke loose. It you were abandoning difficult. her. All the yes. other mothers did it. <laughs> that mm, that sure. was our favorite. All the other mothers do it. They make sure their children are very comfortable when they're not living That's at home. Right. Um, and just the harassment, the sheer level of harassment mm -hmm. that I went through with that. But after, I would say it took about six months to a year mm -hmm. and it calmed down. Yeah. And then of course, ultimately that served her so well because then she stepped into the role of being responsible for her own financial well-being, mm -hmm. which is good for her. Yeah, it's, it's great. Good for her. And I think often, what we mistake is being that person's only savior mm. is really, they say, oh, well, mom's easy. I'll go to her. <laughs> you know, we're not this great savior. We're just an easy pit stop along the way. So uh, that's a great example. It doesn't and... take you much to ask. And they know how much it takes us to say no. Oh, good point. They know. Mm -hmm. And they're banking on that which is why they asked us. And so I think I appreciate your candor to tell us that we can and should expect to have some relational turmoil when we begin to heal and choose different ways to interact with the people in our lives in the world. I, I thank you for saying there is a cost to this and you will feel it in other people's reactions who are not at all going to appreciate you pulling out of a codependent role no, of their life. No, they're not appreciate our codependent growth. No. no, 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 no. It's it's kept a lot of things on the rails for them. And so you are it right about this. Well, yeah. it, it feels bad. It feels bad because that's not a feeling I was accustomed to. I was not accustomed to um, being on the receiving end of you're abandoning me and why won't you help me with this? And why won't you do this? And it doesn't feel great, but then it eventually does. It eventually mm -hmm. feels healthy and true and whole. Um, and so it's worth staying the course on even through the discomfort. For well, sure. And I, I, I think the choice is, be, is either between that greater, that discomfort you've been talking about when they keep banging on the wall to see if it's really a wall mm. and the discomfort we feel when we give in, when we do something we really don't want to do. Uh, when we take care of a person yeah. in a way that we feel victimized by it, that is just keeping yes. our victim story going. And it doesn't, that doesn't feel good. Although for many of us, it feels so comfortable. It definitely feels familiar, yeah. which can be comforting. Yeah. Like, are any of us happy? No, but at least we are we familiar. We know where we're going to stand with the, with the victim yeah. story. We know where yeah. we're going to land. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's yeah. predictable. Mm -hmm. Um, so I appreciate this so very much, and it's made a huge difference in my life, really a huge difference. And it's been interesting to emerge, um, from a divorce and, and no, nobody loves a victim's more story more than a divorced person. That's oh. the best. Well, no one deserves one more. That's part of the weird uh, trap of it all. Because some of that is true, um, it is. but some of that is true. But then to walk into, for me, a new relationship, first, first new relationship since 1992. So what do I know? And then go, oh my gosh, look at what I am doing. That same thing, that exact same thing. That was something that we circled the drain on for 26 years. I'm like, oh, that's fine. Oh, how exciting to discover that belongs to me. That's my behavior. That is my reaction. And if I don't address it, I will take it into every single relationship I will ever have. Um, and so I hate to tell, the, tell you that you were right. I absolutely hate it, but you were right. Um, this is ours. It's our work. I want to ask you this, Melody, as we start to wrap it up here. It's not for the faint hearted. Oh God, isn't it? It really isn't. You know, and ultimately it's about discovering every day who we are it's not a job that's done ever 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 you have done a remarkable job you are absolutely adorable that's absolutely nice. adorable that is really sweet thank you um i i talk about 
your stuff in therapy a bunch. So um, it, it really can change us for the better if we're willing to face it. And there's a, a deep sense of humility that has to come this, with this work because you have to end up saying, oh, this is mine. This is my reaction. This is my ownership. This is my part in it. Um, but there's just freedom on the other side. It is worth it. All of this is worth it. And our relationships improve. Do you know what else? Yeah, what? Can happen. I was sitting out front of my house one day and I live in a beautiful neighborhood. I, I should have no reason to be sulky. And a woman came by and she just looked at me and smiled and said, enjoy your life. My first response was, how in the hell am I going to do that? My second was, yeah, you're right. And it's something else I try and do every day, no matter what I'm going through. Am I, is it important to me to enjoy my, my life, not your life, not his life, not her life, to enjoy my life today and to love myself at least as much as I love others? Mm, that's so good. And everybody benefits from that perspective. Like all the people that we love deeply benefit when we can seize that concept and that we are loving ourselves inside of a relationship. I, this is really good for everyone, not just the individual who's willing to practice this hard work. Um, it's good for us all. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, math is not my specialty. You see, you wrote this in 86, whatever. This book's been in the world for some time. We got, we have decades here. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to just know what it has been like for you to now at this point, been the teacher for a couple of generations. I mean, you're onto the next generation of people who are being introduced to your work and being changed by it. What's it been like for you since you have put this work out and then been able to watch it impact literally the world? I mean, it sold a jillion copies for good reason. And you're, it, it, has, it has changed people's lives. I just have to know how this has felt for you all this time. Do you ever just still sit around and go, oh, oh my gosh, like this was a really important piece of work that I put into the world. I know it kind of amazes me sometimes. Um, it's yeah. one of the reasons I decided to go back and microscopically dissect this book and put new language in it, put a new chapter in it, rewrite some of the stories because yeah. it is worthy. It's my legacy. It's it, my is. legacy. it is. It's what I'm it's a good with. one. It's such a good one. I just want to personally thank you um, for how well it has served me. And I'm, I feel so excited because this is something that you've helped me understand and learn and lean into. And now I feel so hopeful about the second half of my life. So hopeful. I think, look what kind of person I get to be in the second half of my life. Look how, look at the relationships I can build on a different foundation. How wonderful, how wonderful look, for me. Look at all your new superpowers, you know. Look at my new superpowers. It's very exciting. And, and these are things I get to teach my kids. It's not too late for them. They're in their early 20s and late teens. Um, these are things that they can learn now, not when they're 47 like me. Um, <laughs> they can learn them now and build strong from the get, from the jump. And so I'm just really grateful for you and to you um, for everything that you've done. And I wanna ask you just one last question. This is actually a question that I ask all of my guests. And I borrowed this from a priest that I love. And she, this is her question, but I just loved it so much that I ask everybody this question. And you can answer this however you see fit. You can answer this in an earnest, like tender way, or it can, you can answer it with something ridiculous. We get them all and we love them all. Her question is, what is saving your life right now? Three things. Okay. Number one, Wordle. I, I love that game. And it's not enough to get you obsessed, just That's right. enough to brighten your day. Is it the first thing you do? Like, do you reach right for your phone? I do. Yeah. Much. Well, no, I don't actually. I, the, the other is the second thing, and that's meditation. Oh, yeah, I me too. Uh, meditation, and I'm talking about strictly eyes closed, a mantra, meditating for a minimum of 20 minutes a day, and lately yeah. it's been 40. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Rolling Stones. <laughs> 
Yes. I'm so That's, grateful to have lived my lifetime with them, you know, aren't you? back from. That's always the right answer. The Rolling Stones. Absolutely always. That's, that should be everyone's answer to that question. I think yeah, so. we are lucky. We got to be in their generation. We got yeah, to bear witness really. firsthand. And um, believe it or not, believe it or not, I some faint part of me believes we're all very fortunate and blessed to be here right now hmm. and going through all these major changes hmm. that are taking place that it's not happening to us. We're, we're blessed to be part of this time of great transformation on this planet. Mm. I mean, it does have its ups and downs, so it doesn't. I appreciate that. I appreciate that perspective and that sense of hope um, and this mental shift that perhaps we are getting to be a part of a wonderful new world that we're gonna get to help create and we're gonna get to contribute to and that we is, will grow up in. Yeah. I hope that you're right. And I know that that's the way that you're living your life. It's hopefully the way I'm living mine as well. Um, saying the words and believing the truths and uh, that I think will matter, that I think are healing and wholesome and good and connective. And, and thus we go, we build the world we want. So um, I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate that bit of hope and I appreciate you. Well, so thank, thank you, for you. in asking me to help build this world with you today. I'm Absolutely. really so happy you were my first podcast ever. I, I will never, ever forget that. And if you think I'm not going to tell a hundred people by tomorrow that you said that, think again. Um, <laughs> Melody's my first podcast was Melody was I, my, her very first. I mean, listen, that's something that you've given to me that can never be taken away. So right. thank, <laughs> okay. you. thank you. Thank you. It was me again. Bye. We barely scratched the surface. I mean, just barely. I, 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 there's no way I can possibly recommend her book more. Um, Codependent no more. I'll tell you what Brene told me, order it and have it tomorrow. Um, read it cover to cover. You may be surprised what you learn about yourself. You really may. Um, you may be surprised what you learn about the other people around you. And um, this takes a, a pretty high degree of courage and humility and tenacity to engage in this work. But I am just telling you it is worth it. Um, some of the codependent behaviors that I have laid down, I just did not even know how heavy they were. I really didn't. And there is free, there's freedom on the other side of this work, not just for the people that are then able to be responsible for their own lives as they always should have been, but also for us. So if you go to the show notes at jenhatmaker.com, we'll have all this for you guys. Um, and all the links to all of her work, everything Melody related. So on behalf of Laura and her team and Amanda and I and our whole crew, uh, we are thrilled about you and we're, we love to serve you and we can't wait to bring you more. All right, you guys, see you next time.